Welcome to all of you to this Jack Case Reports webinar. We have a focus on heart failure uh, for this webinar, and we're going to be discussing two really fascinating cases. I'm Mary Noreen Walsh from the St. Vincent Heart Center of Indiana, and I'm joined today by a panel of discussants, Dr. Noel Fine from Livin Cardiovascular Institute from the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada, Dr. Estefania Olivares from Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia, um, Dr. Yevgeny Brelovsky from Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. And um, Dr. Gropsa was going to join us, but she, she was unable to join us tonight. Um, but for the case presentations, we're joined today by Dr. Peter Vismas and Dr. Yulbrich Jordy from Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx to present their case of cardiac sympathetic denervation for refractory ventricular arrhythmia in a continuous flow left and assist device. And followed by that, we will hear from Dr. Stephanie Wiltshire and Dr. Andrew uh, Jabor from St. Vincent Hospital in Sydney, Australia. And they'll present their case, twice bitten, thrush shy, a case of recurrent isolated cardiac sarcoidosis in the transplanted heart. So welcome to all of you. It's really great pleasure to have you. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the first case presentation. Sure, I'll go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Walsh, uh, for the invitation to uh, present our case. Um, our case is entitled Cardiac Sympathetic Denervation for Refractory Ventricular Arrhythmia in Continuous Flow Left Ventricular Assist Device. And I'm one of the cardiology fellows here at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York City. And I'm joined by Dr. Yordi, uh, who mentored me on this project. Um, and he's a section head of advanced heart failure and transplantation. Next. So I'm going to present the case of a 46-year-old woman. Uh, she has a history of peripartum cardiomyopathy. She had a CRTD device. And two years prior to this presentation, she had a HeartMate3 LVAD implanted. She's listed for cardiac transplantation. And she's UNO status 4. And she's highly sensitized. She has a history of ventricular tachycardia. And she's currently on mixolytine 150 milligrams twice daily and amiodarone 400 milligrams daily. She's currently presenting to us with ventricular tachycardia with recurrent ICD shocks. Next. Labs at presentation show a hemoglobin of 13.8, a potassium of 4.5, a creatinine of 1.3, a TSH of 11.8, and a free T4 of 1.6. ECG on presentation shows uh, sequential atrial and ventricular pacing. And on in interrogation of the LVAD, there were no low flow alarms and there were no suction events. When we looked at a transthoracic echo, the LVEF remained 10% and the end diastolic diameter was 7.9. The aortic valve remained closed on all beats. And when looking back at previous echoes, there was stable biventricular chamber size and stable RV function. And the LVAD infill cannula was stable at the LV apex. When we went on to interrogate the ICD, there were a number of ventricular arrhythmias. ATP terminated two episodes, and shock terminated about three episodes. <clears throat> so EP was consulted uh, for this case uh, the following day. However, however, they deemed her not to be a good candidate for VT ablation. There were concerns for technical difficulties with epicardial access and catheter entrapment. And, um, and given her non-ischemic substrate, substrate, there was uh, concerns for the likelihood of reduced likelihood of success. While she remained in the hospital, she was hemodynamically stable. However, she continued to have these brief episodes of palpitations and lightheadedness on telemetry at the time revealed a slow VT, which we can show here is one of one of the episodes. And you could see that this curus is different from her presenting uh, ECG. And this was despite IV amiodarone and mixilatine. And she also met different epicardial features um, for VT. Uh, was a maximum deflection index of greater than 0.55, an IDT of greater than 85 milliseconds, and a pseudo delta wave of greater than 34 milliseconds. Therefore, at this point, we had a multidisciplinary discussion. Given the recurrent ventricular arrhythmias, refractory now to both IV and POMT arrhythmics, and we considered her for unal status upgrade for an urgent cardiac transplantation. However, given the highly uh, synthesized state, 
uh, was a CPRA of 63% for HLA class 1 antigens and 100% for HLA class 2 antigens, she was at considerable risk for transplant rejection without the time that we needed to implement desensitization therapies. And just to remind everybody, the indications for an upgrade in you know, status 1, the patient, uh, these are patients on VA ECMO, these are patients that are non-dischargeable, surgically implanted biventricular support devices, or the mechanical circulatory support patient with life-threatening matricular arrhythmias, such as our patient. So where do we stand at this time? We tried antiarrhythmics. She did not tolerate it, and she continued to have episodes while on the floor. EP evaluated the patient and did not see her as a good candidate for VT ablation. And we did consider upgrading her status to get an urgent tra transplant. However, she was at risk for transplant rejection given the highly sensitized state. Therefore, we went ahead and, and we actually discussed doing a cardiac sympathetic denervation. So she underwent this procedure, uh, the surgery, and it was performed with uh, uh, video assisted thoroscopy with bilateral stelectomy. She remained symptom free and arrhythmia free and was actually discharged five days post procedure. So what is cardiac sympathetic denervation? This is when the lower half of the stellate ganglion and the thoracic ganglion from T1 to T4 are transected bilaterally. This interrupts sympathetic flow to the heart, and it's good for patients who are refractory to medical and ablation therapies. It reduces the incidence of sustained ventricular arrhythmias, and it also reduces the amount of recurrent ICD shocks. And luckily, over one year follow-up later, she remains symptom-free uh, from ventricular arrhythmias. So some discussion points on ventricular arrhythmias in continuous flow LVADs. Um, the definition of an early, an early ventricular arrhythmia is one that occurs within 30 days of LVAD implant, and usually within the first week. It's associated with a premature post-op mortality, and the mortality is actually augmented sevenfold when, there, when, this is done in, when this is seen in conjunction with an electrical storm. Potential ideologies include electrolyte shifts, uh, aggressive LV unloading, volume reduction, and suction events. One study that looked at early ventricular arrhythmias after LVAD implantation is um, one study, and the one observational study that looked at this was the one that looked at 19 centers, about total about 652 patients, um, most of which heart me two patients. Um, they had about early ventricular arrhythmias were seen in about 162 of these patients. 70% of these patients had one to five ventricular arrhythmias. About 13% had over 10 ventricular arrhythmias. And usually this was seen in more than 50% in the first week. Uh, if you go one more. Sure, so here's, here's just the pie graph showing that from day one to day seven, you usually see your early ventricular arrhythmias. And then uh, we show here that in figure 2a, that 30-day post-op uh, mortality is increased when you have an early ventricular arrhythmia on the right, on the left there. And then on the right, when you put that in conjunction with um, um, an electrical storm, it actually worsens mortality. But if at discharge, the patient um, is alive and gets the discharge, the early ventricular arrhythmia does not influence long-term survival. When looking at late ventricular arrhythmias, the definition is this occurs one month after LVAD implant, and it is not associated with an increase in mortality. Potential ideologies include underlying structural heart disease, a myocardial scar substrate, suture lines, or RV dysfunction. So to continue, uh, we looked at ICD therapies in LVAD patients. So ICD therapy post LVAD implant remains debatable. It's a class two recommendation in LVAD patients with sustained ventricular arrhythmias. There's no survival benefit um, from ICT therapy in LVAD population. However, when looked at from, I guess, a secondary prevention point of view, sometimes it helps if patients continue to have refractory ventricular arrhythmias leading to RV failure, you could consider it. However, most of the research that's done at this point in this area is, uh, is in patients with heart rate twos. When you look at catheter ablation in LVAD patients, it's limited by the epicardial axis and catheter entrapment. Um, ECGs are unreliable in predicting uh, ventricular arrhythmia location, giving the distort, given, this is due to like a LV distortion due to the LVAD. And procedural success ranges from about 77 to 86%. And again, in heart rate three patients, there's not much studies looking at catheter ablation. So this was one study, if you go one more, 
So looked at nine centers that looked at the characteristics of VT ablation in continuous flow LVAD devices. They looked at 34 HeartMate 2 patients with intractable VT. There were 39 ablation procedures and 110 VT events. Of the 110 VT events, only 10% were cannula related and over 90% or near 90% were due to scar, usually in the epicardial region. So what did we take from this study? We took from the study that patients that are more likely to have early ventricular arrhythmias are ones that have ventricular arrhythmias before LVAD implant. Ventricular VT um, um, ablation uh, done within the first month of LVAD implant is safe. And intrinsic myocardial scar rather than apical cannula, rather than the apical cannula seems to be the dominant substrate for early ventricular arrhythmias in these patients. So just to remember, if you can go more, the location of VT in LVAD patients is less likely at the L apex or inflow cannula and most likely at the epicardial site, depending on the scar. So this takes us to cardiac um, sympathetic innervation. And again, this is looked at as a temporary resolution to ventricular arrhythmias. It's considered when catheter ablation is not feasible. It also reduces the ventricular arrhythmia of burden and allows for the discontinuation of amiodarone therapy, which um, can then therefore reduce the incidence of primary graft failure in patients who later go on to transplantation. But as a first line therapy for ventricular arrhythmias post LVAD, cardiac sympathetic innervation is not suitable with the current guidelines. Below is a study here that shows cardiac sympathetic denervation for refractory ventricular arrhythmias in a retrospective analysis by international centers. They looked at 121 patients with structural heart disease with an average EF of about 30% and refractory VT or VT storm who underwent cardiac sympathetic denervation. What, at one year follow-up, 58% of patients remained free of ICD shocks or sustained VT. And again, 50% remain free of the composite outcome of ICD shocks, transplants, and death. And another study here, which, which was a meta-analysis, looked at 14 non-randomized studies. 311 patients uh, were looked at with refractory VT or VT storm that underwent cardiac sympathetic denervation. And again, freedom from VT after cardiac sympathetic denervation was about 60% was the total ICD docs per person diminished by three. So therefore, in conclusion, um, cardiac sympathetic denervation can be considered in patients with LVADs who are unresponsive to pharmacological catheter ablation or ICD therapies for ventricular arrhythmias. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Vlismas and, and Dr. Yorde for that fascinating presentation and, uh, and an excellent case report, uh, really amazing. Um, we have a few questions for you and I'd like to get us started. So our first question is, um, uh, given how frequently, as you pointed out, we see ventricular arrhythmias as a complication in patients with uh, left ventricular assist devices, um, and you've introduced this novel therapy, do you think their status for transplant um, or their eligibility for transplant might influence your threshold for using sympathetic denervation therapy in the future. So, for example, would your threshold for using this uh, be different for a patient who is uh, destination therapy bad? So, you want to take that? You take it. Okay. So, I think that uh, for a patient who's destination uh, destination therapy bad, I think. Um, you know, in those patients, potentially, um, we could use amiodarone in those patients. Um, you know, we're concerned about using amiodarone because of the increase in primary graft failure um, going forward. So patients that are, we're, we're going to try to bridge to transplant. I think that this is a potential therapy as we've used in our patient here. But I think patients who are not a bridging to tr transplant, I would say it's um, potential that you can um, just keep those patients on amiodarone. Yeah, I agree with that. We have uh, for DT patients who can remain on amiodarone without harm, we probably would not subject them to uh, to the procedure if they're well controlled. We we have uh, others have reported association of amio and primary graft failure. We have a paper in review now showing that if uh, you are on amiodarone and you have a continuous flow pump that risk is even higher. It's like a synergistic effect. So our practice uh, here at Montefiore is we will stop amiodarone in patients who are on an LVAT. And if ventricular arrhythmias recur, which they often don't, 
then we will consider uh, cardiac sympathetic denervation because we do not like to take the patient to transplant on an LVAD on a myodorone. Great, thank you. The question I had for the for you guys was how do you see cardiac sympathetic denervation feed in all the armamentarium that we're using for the management of ventricular arrhythmias in this post LVAD population? Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think that you have to maximize beta blocker therapy, you have to maximize amiodarone, which is used here um, first. Um, and then I think when you work with EP, I, th I think you have to assess a patient for ablation. Um, however, we're seeing now, as we showed here in, in our presentation, that the cannula site is not the most common site for um, this as a substrate for ventricular tachycardia. It looks to be more like the epicardial region. So there is concerns with technical aspects of undergoing ablation. So, yeah, I mean, regarding uh, I'm I have to make sure I understand your question correctly. Uh, the the place of uh, cardiac sympathetic innovation or the uh, the place of uh, ablation at the time of LVAT implant. Let me briefly speak to the latter first. Ablation at the time of implant uh, was very appealing initially when we thought that the arrhythmias arise uh, from the cannula site. So an easy circumferential epicardial ablation seemed to be a strike of genius maybe five, 10 years ago. But now we understand that actually there are very few arrhythmias uh, coming from that region. We also understand that patients on LVAT who get VT are those who have VT before the LVAT goes in. So I think there is a somewhat limited role for intraoperative uh, ablation. There's also some concern from case reports that if you do an endocardial ablation or epicardial at the time of implant, that there seems to be anecdotally a higher risk of uh, thrombus formation, particularly hypothesizing that at the endocardial ablation site after Albert implant with altered flow conditions in the left ventricle, clot may form there. So therefore, we do not do that. The role of CSD is, uh, I think, A, if the patient DT is refractory to uh, First beta blocker, then other antiarrhythmics, or in our practice, and I believe uh, many other centers will follow this or are already doing it. Uh, a transplant, a patient who is a, a transplant uh, candidate, and we want to get get them off amiodarone. At this point in time, we believe the risk of the uh, cardiac sympathetic innovation outweighs uh, or the risk of primary graft failure on amio outweighs the risk of this procedure, which is relatively simple. Thank you so much. Um, let me jump in. I've got a couple of questions for you. First, the really nice work. Um, I think in particular stressing that the, the fact that the um, the cannula, we, we started out in the business of LVADs thinking that the cannula was the whole problem. And I think we've learned a lot. So, so your case and your discussion has really outlined that and really highlighted that. Uh, let me ask you a sort of a team based question. Who does the procedure at your institution? This is a procedure that can be done by several different types of uh, physicians. Who does it at your institution? It would be, a, in our case, would be a thoracic surgeon, Dr. Scheinin, who was a co author on this paper, or other thoracic surgeons that are familiar with this. We also have uh, anesthesiologists who may uh, just place a stellate ganglion block. Uh, and sometimes uh, we can consider doing this first before performing the definitive procedure. Uh, I mean, it sounds good the way I say that. The reality is that our case number is extremely low at this point. But this is, I think, the sequence. If you have a skilled uh, anesthetist uh, that is familiar with this, that would be the first approach, particularly if it's rather urgent to do it. And after that, it's uh, at least in our institution, it's a thoracic surgeon. I think that would be uh, the most common person to do this not an electrophysiologist. Interesting. Yeah, we, actually at our institution, I think we, we might have uh, less experience than you. We have our interventional radiology team is is quite adept at this now. So, but I, yeah. I think it's probably going to be um, maybe expanded teams will be doing it, but I, I really think it's an important uh, piece of uh, our to, in, a tool in our toolkit. Um, also, I would just want to point out just for the audience who is not a transplant audience, you know, congratulations for not gutting it out in um, 
elevating your patient to status one just in the hopes uh, because you obviously took really good care of the patient by by using this technique. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? That was a great case. Thank you so much. My question is, would you ever consider uh, this procedure up front instead of waiting for the patient to develop BT at the time of LVAT uh, in particular doing the sympathectomy? I don't, I personally don't think that we would consider it um, up front. I think there's still um, a lot to learn in regards to this. Yeah, I agree with that. We, if a patient had a refractory arrhythmias, uh, we would, we would probably not uh, implant an LVAT. We might do this procedure to make the patient a candidate for LVAT, uh, but we would not do it uh, prophylactically in somebody at the time of, of LVAD. Great, so before we move on to the next case, do you wanna give us any uh, update on your patient that's not published? Patient's doing well. Yeah, she hasn't had any arrhythmias over a year. Yeah, waiting, waiting for transplant. Still waiting, but, okay. But nowadays, thanks to the new allocation system, if you're stable on an LVAD, uh, it will take some time, as you all know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe we'll have a webinar on that someday. But uh, thanks for excellent patient care, and uh, all of us hope for the best for your patient. Yeah, thanks so much for Thank having you us. Much. Um, we'll go on to the next case. Uh, Dr. Wiltshire. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this case. So I'm Stephanie Wiltshire. I'm one of the advanced trainees at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. I'm here with Professor Jabor, who's one of the heart failure and transplant specialists. Um, so our case is um, a case of recurrent isolated cardiac sarcoidosis in the transplanted heart. So next slide. Yep. So our case presentation is of a 43-year-old male who presented to the heart transplant heart transplantation clinic with palpitations. This was occurring three years post heart transplantation for isolated cardiac sarcoidosis. He had a personal heart rate monitor that was detecting intermittent bursts of tachycardia exceeding 200 beats per minute. His past medical his history included, as mentioned, heart transplantation three years prior. Um, at the time, it was presumed to be secondary to idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, and he was experiencing um, recurrent ventricular tachycardia requiring implantation of an ICD. It was only at the time of the histological assessment of the explanted heart uh, was it demonstrated that there was granulomatous infl inflammation composed of numerous tightly packed small non-necrotizing granulomas, which was consistent with cardiac sarcoidosis. And when looking back at the transplant workup, it was revealed that there was no evidence of other organ involvement. Uh, the patient was otherwise, he had no significant medical history other, other than this. His post-transplant recovery course was relatively unremarkable. He did have a CMV activation, um, which was successfully treated with valgancyclovir one month post-transplant. -trans he had a single episode of grade 2R cellular rejection two months post-transplant, which was successfully treated with pulse methylprednisolone, followed by a weaning schedule of prednisone. And he was completely weaned off his steroids by 18 months post-transplant in light with consistently negative surveillance endomyocardial biopsies. And he was even able to return to mountain bike riding, which was his personal interest within one year of his transplantation. His regular medications included tacrolimus, everolimus, aspirin. He was also on trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, cholecalciferol, calcium, magnesium, and pravastatin. So next slide. Yeah. So his investigations were, his electrolytes were unremarkable. He had an ECG, um, which is demonstrated on the top of this slide, which showed a sinus rhythm with right axis deviation and a non-specific intraventricular conduction delay, resulting in a widened QRS of 150 milliseconds. If you see below, um, this is his earlier post-transplant um, ECG, which showed sinus, uh, sinus rhythm with, without an evidence of any conduction delay or axis shift. He had an echocardiogram, which demonstrated normal left ventricular size and function, but he did have the presence of a new regional wall motion abnormality at the basal septum. He underwent CT coronary angiogram, uh, which only demonstrated mixed plaque in the proximal LAD with a 20% luminal stenosis. His exercise stress echocardiogram, echocardiogram demonstrated no evidence of inducible ischemia at a high aerobic capacity, and his halter monitor demonstrated multiple episodes of symptomatic ventricular tachycardia. So 
Yeah, and this is just a, a sample of his uh, rhythm strip demonstrating the ventricular tachycardia. Um, he underwent cardiac MRI, um, which as you can see here, demonstrated wall thinning, hyperkinesis, hyperkinesis and near transmural late gadolinium enhancement of the basal interventricular septum without active myocardial inflammation or edema. He then underwent um, uh, endomyocardial biopsy, which you can see on the top, um, which showed scattered multinucleated giant cells within the myocardium. And then when we compared that to the, um, the slides of the explanted heart below, you can see the similarities. Uh, once again, that, that uh, demonstrated multinucleated giant cells within the myocardium of the explanted heart. Yep. Next slide. Yep, so um, regarding so the treatment, uh, so an implantable resynchronization therapy defibrillator was inserted. And the patient was treated with a steroid bolus of methylprednisolone, one gram daily for three days, followed by weaning prednisone at one milligram per kilogram in divided doses per day. Um, he was weaned by five milligrams per day until a dose of 20 milligrams was achieved. And then he was um, underwent a more gradual taper down to a maintenance of 7.5 milligrams daily, which he has remained on uh, in conjunction with his other immunosuppressive medications. He was able to return to his normal activities um, reasonably quickly with no further palpitations. Since then, he's had three cardiac device checks, um, which have demonstrated he's had four episodes of non-sustained VT, but none of those episodes have required anti-tachycardia pacing or ICD therapy. He underwent another cardiac MRI one year later, which showed a similar appearance to the one that I showed before. And almost two years post present presentation and five years post initial transplantation, he remains asymptomatic with preserved allograft function. Okay. So just looking at a bit of the literature surrounding cardiac sarcoidosis in both the non-transplanted non -transplanted population as well as the transplanted population, there is uh, quite a deficiency in evidence with quite low patient numbers in most studies. Um, so there is a retrospective um, review by Vindo and his team of only 12 patients that found that patients with cardiac sarcoidosis who received corticosteroids had improved cardiac MRI findings at 12 months compared to those who, who didn't. In saying that, in that study, it was only six of the patients who showed significant improvement, whereas um, uh, I think there was only three were stable and the rest had actually worsened, so quite small numbers. Um, it's also corticosteroid treatment has been demonstrated to reduce myocardial inflammation and improve left ventricular ejection fraction. So this is uh, a study by Osborne and the team and his team, um, where there was 23 patients um, who had serial MRI, uh, ser sorry, serial PET scans over two years, and this was their findings. A prospective study by Nadal and the team um, of 106 patients um, who were. Uh, recruited due to having either suspected cardiac sarcoidosis or proven cardiac sarcoidosis, um, who they performed cardiac MRIs on, they demonstrated no significant, significant difference in VT or sudden cardiac death in those with cardiac MRI detected cardiac sarcoidosis on corticosteroid therapy to those not on therapy. And uh, there is a lack of evidence suggesting corticosteroids um, reduce the manifestations and clinical sequelae of cardiac involvement. So then moving on to the very limited data in the transplanted population, there is some reports of similar improved outcomes post-transplantation from cardiac sarcoidosis compared to with other disorders. In saying that, there was a retrospective re review um, of only 14 patients, which showed a trend towards high mortality in patients with car cardiac sarcoidosis who underwent transplantation, but that was not statistically significant. A small study um, of 19 patients demonstrated that patients with cardiac sarcoidosis who underwent transplantation who were maintained on low-dose corticosteroids, um, none of those developed rec recurrent cardiac sarcoidosis in saying that three developed um, extra cardiac sarcoidosis despite being maintained on low-dose corticosteroids. And our case is one of few reported cases of recurrent isolated cardiac sarcoidosis in a transplanted heart. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Wiltshire and Dr. Jabour. Another very cool case, uh, fascinating. Um, I'll start us off with some questions again for you. 
Uh, so it was really interesting that uh, this patient's recurrence was first detected uh, through their use of a, a wearable device. Uh, and these devices have become very popular and studied uh, quite a lot in the heart failure population, probably less so in the transplant population. Uh, two questions then. So is this something that you recommend to the patient or is that something that the patient did voluntarily? And do you think wearable devices have a role in monitoring transplant patients for various complications moving forward? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. That's a great question. Thanks, Noel. Um, the, now, this patient is a very bright, young or middle-aged gentleman who uh, who was really in tune with his body. And uh, the first time he was uh, struck down by cardiac sarcoidosis, there was no premonition of it. And so a wearable for him was something he wanted to do. That was of his own back. And and certainly it, it has proved to, to to have potentially saved his his life on the second time around. I think you know, I think wearables are cool. There's good data for wearables uh, in the general population. And I and I hope that we can build the data to to demonstrate that um, that wearables will be good in the transplanted population. If you think about it, Really, uh, the transplanted heart is denervated, uh, you know, which, which links us to the first case. It's a denervated heart and patients don't often feel these arrhythmias or angina or any other cardiac problems. And as such, a, a wearable device provides continuous monitoring. There's, a, there's good data uh, to say that uh, a simple ECG uh, can help uh, detect um, not of, of course, arrhythmias, but also rejection. And um, as wearables get better, it's quite possible that wearables may also be able to be uh, to, de to detect rejection at an early stage, or even at a late stage uh, where where patients haven't recognised their symptoms or put their symptoms down to another thing, for example, a virus, um, and it will alert the physicians to call that patient call that patient in. One of the big problems with wearables is it's a lot of data and there's cost and, and there's, there's going to be unnecessary downstream testing uh, for, for a lot of patients in this situation. And those things need to be ironed out. Well, thank you. No, I'd agree. I think it, uh, there's a lot of potential uh, for utilization in our transplant patients moving forward. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Nick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious, how would you differentiate this uh, from uh, giant cell myocarditis? Uh, the patient, from what I recall, had only arrhythmias before, right? Uh, no heart block, uh, no uh, extra cardiac manifestations of sarcoidosis, and then had the recurrence. Um, I wouldn't know how to do that, but I'm asking you. Yeah, so look, you, you, you pose a very good question. It's a very difficult question. Giant cell myocarditis versus isolated cardiac sarcoidosis. And they're often considered the, the twins of T cell myocarditis. Um, are, they, are they two ends of, of a single, two ends of the spectrum of a single disease, uh, or are they two distinct entities? And people continue, continue to argue about that. You know, they, they're both, both of those processes um, uh, have very, very similar histological features. Um, it is, it's thought that giant cell myocarditis has more necrosis uh, rather than non-necrotizing -ne uh, granulomas. But people would, could argue about this. And perhaps if we'd sampled his transplanted heart a bit more, uh, we may have found uh, necrosis. Uh, we, we did have the, um, the benefit of seeing his explanted heart and analyzing that, and there was little necrosis there. There was little eosinophilia there. But not that either of those histological features would be a definitive uh, uh, distinction between the two entities. Either way, he's declared himself to have quite serious arrhythmias, both pre-transplant and interestingly, when heavily immunosuppressed post-transplant. Uh, so um, is this a giant cell myocarditis uh, in disguise? Uh, quite possibly, quite possibly. But uh, the histological features that, that have been observed and reported have been labelled as cardiac sarcoidosis. Yeah, thank you. Really interesting. Um, what about PET scanning? I know you're struggling with this patient's immune suppression and in regular cardiac sarcoidosis, we use PET scan. 
to determine uh, whether we can come off uh, immunosuppression. Of course, you cannot come off completely in this patient. Is that something uh, that you have considered, or what would be your recommendation for this? You know, PET scanning is also ideal, and in many in in many circumstances, patients will have both a PET scan and an MRI scan. And then we look at both data uh, together. The T2 mapping from um, MRI scanning and the late gadolinium enhancement on MRI uh, padding often correlates well with the, the data from PET, adds some specificity to the PET scanning. Um, in many respects, it just comes down to, to cost. PET scans are quite expensive in the Australian healthcare setting. And um, although they're good to, to track disease, you know, T2. Uh, T2 mapping is likewise good to track the track disease. Um, with the right T2 mapping sequences, we've we've been able to demonstrate here locally that we can detect early rejection and late rejection by MRI. And, and then likewise, um, you should be able to detect uh, inflammation and grade that inflammation. People argue that PET scanning can be a bit subjective. Um, it's qualitative, and then you get a yes, no answer. There's inflammation there, there's not inflammation there. Although SUV units are reported, we often, it's often yes, no. Moving forward with this patient, um, MRI scans are likewise good uh, to help track his disease. And I think that they're important that he has them on an annual basis. Post ICD insertion, there's of course going to be artifact on the MRI scan. So it'd be likely that this gentleman um, if we can access it through the funding, the appropriate funding arrangements, we'll have both MRI and PET scan follow up. Um, the question is, um, if you have someone with isolated cardiac sarcoidosis in a, an explant or you suspect before uh, when you're doing your cardiac workup, would that affect your decision of uh, offering um, this patient either an LVAD or proceeding with heart transplant? That, that's, that's a good question. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, my response is biased by the Australian healthcare setting rules. In Australia, LVADs are funded through the, through the federal government um, and the funding is only for patients to, to have an LVAD as a bridge to transplantation. We don't have destination devices in, uh, in Australia. Uh, except in the very, very rare, rare circumstances of self-funding, and even then, um, it's it's a very it's only been a very rare occurrence. So, LVADs are a bridge to transplant in this country. Uh, if if the patient had intractable arrhythmias that were refractory to medical treatment and ablation, uh, and we had no other choice, certainly he would get an LVAD to bridge him to transplantation. As as we've heard before, um, you know, arrhythmia, although. And a left ventricular assist device can help buffer you through periods of arrhythmia. If arrhythmia is, is your primary problem, what you really need is a heart transplant. And you know we, we're, we've got really very uh, good long-term data with heart transplantation, um, both in sarcoidosis and outside of the sarcoid setting, uh, to suggest that these patients should do very, very well and get a good long-term result with heart transplantation. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a little bit about your decision making around immunosuppression. So, in in general, we you know we try to wean steroids. Uh, we sure try by six to eight months in your average patient, um, because we certainly know historically from our our patients from decades ago that um, keeping patients on steroids long term resulted in lots of complications. So. How did you decide um, the length of steroids and your other immunosuppression regimen? So um, initially, the plan was was always in this gentleman to uh, withdraw his steroids uh, slowly over time. And uh, in most patients, um, uh, corticosteroids are completely withdrawn in our unit at that nine to twelve month mark. We've been holding prednisolone doses in those with mild rejection. Uh, or any other significant symptoms of rejection, um, uh, or where there's, whether there's, when there's doubt of uh, about rejection on on biopsy samples. So, but the vast majority of patients, whether they initially had corticosteroid, uh, sorry, initially had sarcoidosis or not, have their steroids weaned. 
and we have a, um, a program where we use CNI and an anti-metabolite as, as long-term treatment. Uh, and that, that mostly, in the vast majority of cases, is tacrolimus and mycophenolate. Uh, in this gentleman, his his weaning was was a little bit slower, and and that had to, in some in some respects it had to do with uh, his biopsy profile, which was by and large uh, benign and some logistic issues. And but he'd eventually gotten off the steroids. Uh, unfortunately, he had a relapse uh, of his uh, cardiac sarcoidosis, which was which was quite severe. And so I think he's earned long term corticosteroids. Mm. Do we have much evidence to say that long term corticosteroids in these gentlemen is going to make a big difference? Well, I, I don't think we do. I, we, I don't think we do. But given the fact that he relapsed off corticosteroids, uh, we felt that um, it was worth a try and that the, the risk of harm from adding in corticosteroids and uh, bolstering his, his immunotherapy um, was lower uh, than the potential uh, benefit that he would receive from that. Certainly, when, you, when you're going off data that is just limited to a few isolated uh, case reports, the evidence is not, is not strong. And so, in many respects, this is an arbitrary decision, uh, which has so far um, uh, been, we think, been the right decision in this gentleman. Thank you. I suppose that the, the next... Case. Thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. Yeah, the next thing to follow on from that is, uh, are we going to put everybody, uh, are we going to maintain everybody um, who has had cardiac sarcoidosis that's required heart transplantation, mm -hmm. who's proved themselves to be, um, you know, to have disease that's quite, quite aggressive, and that, you know, they've had a failed heart initially, should all these uh, patients be maintained on long-term corticosteroids? And although we don't have the answer to that, we've made it, we've made a decision internally uh, that uh, that we will maintain everybody on corticosteroids long term that has had cardiac sarcoidosis or giant cell myocarditis. Um, having said that, it would be nice to put that into a clinical trial, a multicenter clinical trial, to know whether or not, in fact, that's a useful thing to do. <laughs> but uh, I have a question about uh, non-invasive monitoring. Uh, so uh, in the US in particular, we try to get patients off of biopsy schedule by uh, one year, but some centers do it even by six months and substitute Alomap and Alashore instead to monitor these patients. In patients like yours who have cardiac sarcoidosis, I wonder what your approach would be or if there's any data to guide us to uh, monitor these patients with non-invasive measure, measures such as Alomap and Alashore. So uh, I'm, I, th I think that there's, there's good data with Alomap and Alashore. Uh, we don't have that, that access to that technology here in Australia. We have, however, been uh, sending some samples uh, internationally as part of a collaborative uh, clinical trial. Uh, but I would expect that when the uh, technology becomes more widely available and funded here in Australia, that, that such a technology may well be useful. We've taken on the approach, uh, not for this particular gentleman, but uh, to replacing endomyocardial biopsies with uh, cardiac MRI and um, there's some data that should be coming out soon about that. Um, we, we've demonstrated uh, and published, um, uh, we've demonstrated and published in Jack uh, imaging not too long ago that T1 mapping um, can uh, safely detect uh, cardiac rejection, uh, significant cardiac rejection, and that uh, treatment after uh, MRI detected rejection results in an improvement in T1 measures and, and we've, we've subsequently done another study uh, that, that's soon to be published um, that, that, has, that demonstrates that MRI in lieu of a biopsy is safe to do in a prospective randomised fashion. Uh, so I, I actually envisage that the, what the future holds is um, uh, serial MRI scans, biopsies when you're not sure, and the combining the MRI data with Alamap data and other clinical data moving forward to, for transplant rejection surveillance. That's great. Uh, it's, well, I have um, another question, a similar question, actually, but this one's specific to cardiac sarcoidosis. So given that we've seen it can come back after transplant, despite their immunosuppression, um, would you recommend monitoring of these patients for recurrence of their cardiac sarcoid over and above 
you're monitoring for uh, rejection? And if so, what modality would you use and how long would you, would you use it for indefinitely or, or for a shorter period? You know that, that's a, that's a great question, or a great set of great set of questions, and we just we just don't know the answers to that, and 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 really that should be part of of a large multi centre study, but and and in some respects, um, you know, we, we can do a lot of things. We can do a lot of things, and we have to think about the cost of of doing those things. Uh, we found that uh, performing an MRI is actually not that expensive. You can you can get data using multiparametric assessment of the myocardium without getting any administration, which shortens MRI time, shortens MRI cost, and shortens the burden of gadolinium exposure on patients. I think patients who have had um, cardiac sarcoid sarcoidosis should have monitoring with uh, non gadolinium based MRI with periodic gadolinium administration to look for late gadolinium enhancement. In the general transplant population, late gadolinium enhancement has been shown to be prognostic. And I'm sure that uh, in those with cardiac sarcoidosis or giant cell myocarditis who've required transplantation, MRI will be providing useful information. And likewise, PET scan can, can likewise be, um, uh, provide excellent information. In, and, and I do, I would recommend that um, patients have that surveillance. We currently have annual surveillance with echocardiography, stress testing. We have periodic surveillance with coronary imaging, now using CT coronary angiography. And I think using PET scanning and MRI scanning is going to allow us to pick up uh, disease recurrence at a much earlier stage. Excellent, thank you. That's great. I have another question, if I may. Uh, what do you think is the role of ICD for secondary prevention for patients with uh, cardiac sarcoid that occurs in a transplanted heart? And uh, similarly, what is the role of VT ablations with the, those patients? Yeah. So again, li limited by a paucity of data. Uh, and um, but but second, I, I don't see why it should be any different in, than in the non-transplanted population especially for secondary prevention. You know, this is a group of patients who are heavily immunosuppressed already, and then they've declared themselves to have, an have had an episode of, you know, VT or syncope or whatever, or, you know, biopsy proven recurrence. So these patients, there's, there's only so much you can immunosuppress a patient. So I, ICDs, I think, are a good idea. Uh, I would hope that we would have a better data in the future to um, help back that claim up. But, but certainly we, we would not hesitate to put an ICD for secondary prevention in the, in the transplanted heart. VT ablation, and I, I think that's going to depend on, on the center and the expertise. There's no reason why VT ablation could not be attempted, um, uh, but uh, I, I don't think VT ablation should uh, replace or, or further decision for an ICD to be inserted. And um, we would res we would usually reserve VT ablation for those who are refractory to medical antiarrhythmic therapy. Fantastic! Um, great set of questions. Two great cases. I've got one last question for you, if I may. What what kind of shared decision making did you do with the patient prior to transplant around the possibility you your team knew going in? That there might be recurrent sarcoidosis was that shared with your patient? Oh, well, to be honest, I, I I I can't speak for my colleague or the person that that shared that that data with uh, that 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 did the consent for that particular patient. But certainly, um, uh, it should be stated that there is a small risk uh, that cardiac sarcoidosis can recur even in the setting of immu uh, heavy immunosuppression in transplantation. Um, you know, the, if, if you look at our consent forms now for heart transplantation, they're quite long and quite daunting, actually. Uh, if you look at the risks, uh, and even though at, at our centre we're proud that, you know, we're, we're, our, our outcomes are, are better than the international ISHLT uh, numbers, still patients die. Um, and risk and adverse events occur. Uh, we we generally quote a um, a one 
in eight, uh, uh, one in eight mortality at 12 months, a one in eight mortality at 12 months. And if you think about that as a general figure, and then the risk of recurrence of cardiac sarcoid in the transplanted a heart and the things that you can do to treat that, and then the potential for retransplantation. Otherwise, um, I think the, the 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 biggest killers post transplantation is not going to be necessarily early recurrence of cardiac sarcoidosis. It's going to be about general rejection, general infection. Um, uh, it, it's 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 going to be about um, it's it's going to be about graft failure, primary graft failure that we don't that we don't know. Um, but absolutely, uh, any um, future consent should include that there's a potential for this to come back. Right, right. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, those of you who are presenters who chose to submit your case in the first place to, to the journal and uh, for spending time with us today to discuss the cases. And thanks to my fellow presenters. And on behalf of Jack Case Reports and our editor-in-chief, Julia Grafsa, Thanks to everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you very Thank much. You.